Hello everyone. Good morning from Toronto, Canada and good afternoon and good evening to our amazing panelists and our global audience on Zoom and Facebook Live. A very warm welcome to Green Hope Foundation's panel discussion on the very pertinent topic of quality education in the new normal. I'm Keksha, I'm the founder president of Green Hope Foundation and I will be your moderator for this webinar. Now, in a world where children and youth make up the largest segment of civil society, education is perhaps the most critically effective tool that helps us to bridge the opportunity gap. And our advocacy at Green Hope Foundation is based entirely on the education platform. And we have seen firsthand its transformative power in empowering those who are amongst the most vulnerable and marginalized. And while statistics have shown a marked increase in literacy levels and in the number of school going children, this battle is far from over. Before the onset of the pandemic, there were still 165 million children who were out of school, with almost all of them being in the developing nations. And COVID-19 has exacerbated the situation drastically with a disproportionate impact on vulnerable communities, especially on girls. And millions of children from economically challenged communities have dropped out of school, being forced to work just to make the ends meet. And as we slowly come out of the pandemic pause, we need to retool our education system the, as the entire process of education, its content and delivery mechanisms have all changed. And while most countries have opted for digital learning, this cannot be the only solution. So how do we reach out to those who have no access to the internet? How do we have the relevant content? How should education morph itself in the new normal so that it is effective and accessible to all? What does the new normal mean for educators? And in today's day and age, how important are education for sustainable development and peace education at all levels, school and university? So to discuss these challenges and find pathways that can surmount them, Green Hope Foundation has brought together an eminent panel of educators from across the world to pool our common wisdom and find solutions to this unique challenge that faces us today. And I feel privileged to say that I have worked with each and every one of them and I know how amazing they are as educators. So on that note, I would like to invite our first speaker, Ms. Jaya Menezes, Executive Principal of the Apple International School in Dubai. Ms. Jaya, you have the floor. Good evening from all the way from Dubai to everyone. I, I do understand it's not evening everywhere, but it's here it is evening at the moment. Thank you uh, so much, Kehkasha, for inviting me over because uh, I see this wonderful group of panelists and a wonderful platform where I can really reach out to so many people and speak about something about which I'm very passionate. And that, of course, is education. However, although I have an experience of more than 25 years, almost 27 years now as an educator or in India, in the Republic of Maldives, and now perhaps 17 years in the UAE. And still, still, let me tell you this, I was not prepared for this at all. Never ever did we prepare, whether it was in, uh, while I was doing some educational courses or while I was working in different schools across the world. I never come, came across this kind of a situation. But here we are, and it is like this, so what should we do? Well, I would like to give you a little feedback about where I work and uh, how the situation is here in Dubai. So I head a school, which is perhaps a school, of course, it is a British curriculum school, uh, but it has children coming from perhaps uh, middle level backgrounds. Their financial situations is such that um, 
they have chosen to be in a british school uh, but of course the fee structure in my school is quite i would say low as compared to the other british curriculum schools here nevertheless we endeavor we work very hard to provide our children with the same quality of education like any other british curriculum school and that i would say is the usp of the school that this i had so when all this started obviously it was kind of a little panic but i would certainly tell you that the government of dubai has helped us has really held our hands as leaders and has helped us at every step well sometimes we as as educators and as principals found it a bit challenging you see sometimes it would be the survey coming up from khda i think perhaps you all know about khda if not it is that regulatory body which looks after all the schools in dubai particularly and we are grateful that they are there to for quality assurance i would say because they come to every school for a kind of audit every year so there would be surveys from khta there would be surveys from the ministry of education and then of course as uh, responsible leaders we would want to do surveys with the parents so you know collecting all the information collecting so many data and then transforming it to the ministry was not easy for us and were all our teachers prepared to do this i don't think so although we do try our best to pick up hand pick good quality teachers from across the world because the school that i work for has around 59 nationalities studying and working together the students and the teachers are a cross section from across the world and still yeah of course they use modern technology we have ict integrated lessons but that is completely different from what we are doing now and then came up the challenge of making sure that each and every household had the necessary gadgets had the necessary wifi connection so how do we reach out to all these all these children these are our children and then when the pandemic struck we were in the second term of our uh, academic year so we did not know really how to make sure that the curriculum is not affected how to ensure that parents are still satisfied and of course ensure that the fees keeps coming in so that the salaries and the operation costs are you know taken care of so in the midst of all these challenges i feel that we all rose up to that occasion whether it was the leaders whether they were the teachers or the students i think the way the entire body of stakeholders of any school has come together to understand each other's challenges to understand where there might be a bit of a gap because it was not easy to suddenly transform from face to face learning into a mode which was completely distance learning and then to take so many precautions but i would say that my school is in dubai and dubai uh, the government of dubai took extreme measures to ensure that every nook and corner every street and every aspect of dubai is is very well sanitized and um, with the help of the government we were able to make sure that our education continues so i thought i would let you know a bit about the challenges that we faced and in the middle of all this we also had inspection from khda so it's not that we were left alone do what you wish not at all so khda ensured the knowledge human development authority ensured that the schools do not bring down their standards anywhere and according to the rating because we all schools in dubai get a rating by khda uh, the school apple international is a good school since 4 years so to sustain this rating we had to really live up to the occasion now how do we do that uh, you would be surprised to hear that this is dubai and the school is in dubai but many children did not have devices one device each so for example if there was a family which had four children maybe they have one device now what does the school do if the school is planning to have lessons from 8 am then this device particular device has to be shared among four children so such cases such uh, sad stories would reach out to me i i know it was stressful for all of us not only physically but emotionally as well how do we help and as i explained to you earlier that this school has children from middle class families 
to ensure that each and every child. So then we devised this method of synchronous and asynchronous le lessons, where our teachers would record lessons. And we had an understanding with the parents that, okay, if your uh, say son or daughter, whoever has an assessment or something, that particular child can use the device, but perhaps we would send them recorded lessons, which would be uh, taken care in the evening by the parents. We also had small children, two and a half, two and a half years old child in FS1, foundation stage one. How does he or she, you know, I know children these days are really very, very smart in using technology, but still the presence of parent was needed. Then as things started becoming a little better, you see the parents started going for work. And then what do we do? Then the parents wanted to tell us that, no, you should not have lessons in the morning. Perhaps you can have it in the evening. So why I'm relating this whole story is to explain, to reiterate how we educators can really uh, transform, modify teaching and learning. Learning never stops. There can never be a shutdown on learning. It continues. So different ways and devices were perhaps introduced into the system so that learning is not affected. And uh, thankfully, we ensured that none of our children would be deprived of this learning. We use different, different, different measures. So now that I've spoken about the children, I think it is very important that we also talk about our teachers. Teachers, well, uh, while it was face-to-face -face education, we all know how many hours they put in, what all they do, uh, perhaps work for them never stops. They, they carry work home as well. But now, what hit them was perhaps they were not ready for it because they had to manage their own children at home. They had to make sure that they're available to the parents as and when. Plus, the biggest challenge was that teaching and learning was going directly in the houses. And you all would appreciate, you all know that when teaching and learning goes directly into the houses, then the teachers have to really be very, very careful because especially for the younger ones, the parents would also be around and there would be interference from parents, right? I'm sure I can see some of you nodding and it was a big challenge for us. How to tell the parent, no, you're not allowed to sit with your child and interfere in the teaching and learning, right? How to explain to them that this particular teacher is really, I would say burning the lamp during the night and making sure that everything is in place before the next morning. So these were the challenges that we kept facing in and out, but gradually I feel everything fell into place and distance learning became quite uh, a smooth affair in the school where I work. And then suddenly I would say things started uh, happening better, positive, and the number of cases started coming down. We were very, very excited and anxious that, okay, let's now we'll see our children because going to school and not seeing the children around, I don't think that is what we are made of because we all teachers love to interact. That interaction with the humans, that's the most important thing. Now, the situation is this, that we planned for distance learning and blended learning because we did not want that children should come to school every day. Although still, you'll be surprised to know that our parents, the younger ones for foundation stage one, which means they are not even three years old, they all have opted for face-to-face -face learning. And it is only the older ones who want to go for distance learning. However, all this was planned. I will give you one more example. Uh, so till yesterday, we had planned that we will go for this kind of teaching learning. But then due to some conditions, some situations, today again I had to take a call and from tomorrow we are going into complete distance learning. So that is what education is. And that is what is the new normal these days. We really cannot predict what's going to happen next. Although we were ready to have face-to-face uh, -face learning from tomorrow. But this minute, while I'm talking to you, a circular is going home to parents to tell them that from tomorrow, please don't send your child because we will do distance learning for two weeks. And that is what we have to accept. And this is what life is at the moment in my school. So I think as educators, we have a very big responsibility, whether it is distance learning, it is blended learning, whether it is synchronous lesson, asynchronous lesson, we have to ensure that learning never stops. So that's what I think is from my side. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Ms. Jen. And you're right, the pandemic really caught everyone off guard. And it's our hope that we have mechanisms in place now, should anything, God forbid, happen 
in the future, and you also write, it is important for education in the new normal now to be adaptive and ensure that we take into account all the challenges, one of the foremost being the digital divide. So I'd like to thank you for sharing how the amazing measures taken by the Dubai government and the KHDA, uh, how they handle the pandemic, and also how your school and your amazing teachers handle the pandemic and ensure that the students continue to get their quality education. And I had the privilege of speaking to your students during the pandemic, so I can vouch for how amazing uh, the learning uh, was and how it continued even during the, these very trying times. So thank you once again. I would now like to invite our next speaker, Ms. Anuka Day, teacher at the Riverview Alternative School, Ottawa. Ms. Anuka, you have the floor. Hi, thank you for this opportunity, King Desha. It's, uh, it's education and the new normal has definitely been on my mind, as has been on every educator that has been living through this. Um, I teach in the public board, so it's a little bit different from international schools, which I have taught at. And I would say that when they first told us before our spring break that school is going to be closed for two weeks after, don't worry about it. We'll be back in March. Everyone sort of went on March break, stressed and worried, but not sure how to navigate the new normal. Um, technology being a huge part of it. Um, a lot of teachers in Ontario, we have about, um, from elementary to high school, we have about 5,000 schools. So imagine all those teachers trying to navigate how they are now going to reach the population. Um, I teach at an alternative school, which um, by philosophy is supposed to be a school where children, we meet the needs of children according to their own style of learning. Um, what it has become to a certain extent is a behavioral school. So we have a lot of students with learning needs, learning difficulties, social emotional difficulties, trauma. And as an educator, our job at our school is to meet those needs before education. So to take that face-to-face -face connection with our kids and bring it online was one of the most difficult things, I would say. Most teachers across Ontario, but definitely I know at my school, that was the hardest part of the academic or just online learning. What Ontario did as um, extra measures, they did similar um, to your previous panelists, we sent out uh, technology to parents who said that they don't have technology. Uh, when they didn't have technology, they also sent out some Wi-Fi hotspots to help with that. But by the time all of that happened, I would say it was almost mid-April, late April. So not all students had access. And by then, a lot of the students had sort of just stopped connecting with their teachers and their schools. Um, a lot of our issues as well is um, rural children and children who come from uh, group homes or single parents or uh, shelters and to reach those students was the hardest. So, and for me, most of my students who joined are um, two working parents who tried their best to get their kids to do the work that we sent out, um, joined into on the Google Meets when they could, but it was definitely a struggle. So as teachers and educators, our job became calling parents as often as we could without getting to the point where we're bothering them, right? So it's finding that balance between wanting to connect with the student and making sure that during this time of high anxiety for kids and families, we're not encroaching on their anxiety. So we would either, we know our families really well, we, we take the time to create those relationships with the parents in our classroom, um, so that, that was a lot of our like calling, making sure parents who don't speak English understand what the programming is, um, the information coming out from the government, um, do they have the technology? And like many families, two working parents, they're both on the computer. There isn't time for the, them to help the students. So that seemed to be a lot of the issues during what we called the emergency distance learning and not, um, they weren't getting assessed on what they were doing. So the government had put out March 13th was our last day of school and any marks up until March 13th were going to be, that's what they're going to get. They're not going to, the marks are not going to go down, but with emergency distance learning, you can bring your marks up. So that was a huge part of 
I would say it's sort of a double-edged sword for kids who really wanted to better their marks. Absolutely, they were online, they were learning. For kids who were like, you know what? I'm doing really well. And this is too much for me. I'm not going to participate. They had that opportunity to opt out. Um, it's, it's definitely been a huge learning curve. Uh, for September, we are still in the planning stages. Uh, everything sort of uh, being such a big province with so many students and whatnot, we don't have a plan that is solid and that teachers know, like I don't know yet exactly what my assignment will be. But again, I will say as an educator and all the educators I've heard, teachers are adaptive. Um, we'll be planning to go from synchronous to asynchronous to in the classroom to digital to whatever happens. Um, I think everything that was difficult for us from April to June, we've learned and taken the summer to learn all these platforms and figure out how, if we go back to digital, we can do that. And the new normal means like being adaptable and being able to go from one to the other and teaching the kids, like what I'm going back to face to face, teaching the kids that those platforms, hopefully we have the technology to teach the platform so that they can go home and access independently and they're not going to need as much parent support as they needed from April to June because they've never experienced it, right? They didn't expect to not come back to school and not see their friends. So I absolutely believe that adaptability will be what the future of education, I mean, it's always been, but I think even more so adaptability will be the future of our new normal and education and what's happening as we go on. Thank you so much, Anuka. And once again, thank you for highlighting how important it is that, you know, we take we learn how to adapt in the field of education and also thank you for sharing how you're taking the steps to ensure that children regardless of their backgrounds and regardless of the numerous challenges that hinder their education how everyone still has access to education and i'd also like to mention that i did have the privilege of speaking to your class and it was great to see that those who did log on for uh, the digital learning, they were enthusiastic, really enthusiastic, and the <laughs> learning did continue. So uh, thank you once again. And of course, uh, in Canada as well, there were amazing measures that were taken to ensure that uh, the education of all children continue. Thank you once again. I would now like to invite our next panelist, Dr. Pamela Chasek, Department Head and Professor, Political Science at the Manhattan College. Dr. Pamela, you have the floor. Great, thank you very much, Kakshan. Um, let me give a little bit of background just to explain where, where we are. Manhattan College is actually in the Bronx, um, which is the poorest borough of New York City. In New York City, we, hit, we had the COVID cases hit their peak back in the spring. So we shut down on March 11th and went totally virtual with 24 hours notice. They told us on a Monday there would be no Tuesday classes and we were to be fully online on Wednesday. They could have waited till spring break the following week, but they didn't. Um, in New York City, we've um, had over 238,000 cases of COVID and close to 24,000 deaths. In our neighborhood where Manhattan College is and where I live, one in 25 people have had COVID and one in 244 people have died. So it's hit our area very, very strongly. And I believe almost every student, faculty member and staff knows somebody who has died from COVID. So our classes are due to begin Monday. We have had no break this summer in terms of figuring out what we're going to do. Um, were we going to be in person? Were we going to be remote? How are we going to, to deal with it? Um, we have about 3,300 undergraduates at Manhattan College, um, about less than 1,000 graduates, of which 33% are first-generation college students. We are a Lasallian Catholic college, and we, our mission is to give first-generation college students the opportunity of higher education. Most of those first generation college students are immigrants or sons and daughters of immigrants. And about, you know, I would say our, a third of our class, a third of our school is first generation, a third of our 
students are also Latino, African American, and Asian. So they come from various economic backgrounds. And similar to what Jaya had said, not everybody had the technology at home and Anuka as well. Um, I had one student who is one of nine children and suddenly all nine of them were home having to log in. They didn't have sufficient bandwidth. She had no privacy. She often logged into class from the garage because that is the only place she could go where she wouldn't have her siblings running in and out. Um, I believe she's the oldest of nine. So um, many of them had challenges adapting, not to mention because so many of them had family members or friends who had COVID that it was very hard for them to stay focused. Um, I had several students who were diagnosed with COVID back in the spring. Um, so how, you know, what accommodations do you have to make from them? There's no rules for this. Um, how were we going to not only with 24 hours notice adapt to being in a remote situation, but how were we going to take into consideration the um, physical and emotional stress that a lot of our students were under. And somehow we made it through. Um, and I had a lot of my faculty members, we have a small department, but I also as department chair had to mentor my faculty, full-time faculty members, my adjunct faculty members who were juggling different, who teach at multiple schools. And each school had a different way of doing things. So here we're about to start the spring, I mean the fall. And um, there's still a lot of questions. I would say about half of our students are now back on campus. Um, half of them are going to be remote. They had their you know, choice. Do you want to stay at home and be remote or do you want to come to campus? A number of those who have come to campus, their home lives are not good. Um, I have one student who um, had to live on campus last spring because there was an order of protection taken out against her father who had assaulted her sister and her mother. And suddenly she was told to go home. The college realized, oh, we have to make special accommodations that if students are not safe to go home or our international students who were not allowed to get, who could not get flights to go home. So last spring, as well as this fall, they're allowing students who have difficult circumstances at home, the opportunity to stay on campus. Um, we also realized a lot of students did not have um, computers or iPads or that they could take their classes online. So we scrambled last spring and have continued it this fall to provide loaner equipment. We've also created some space on campus for commuting students um, who are often those who live here in the Bronx um, who don't have the technology at home that we've created space with social distancing so that they can actually take their classes on remotely on campus if necessary, but have that equipment that they that they need to hopefully do well. Um, the bigger sort of situation surrounding us is we pride ourselves as many liberal arts colleges do, although we also have engineering and business and education on a personalized form of education. How do you make that personalized in the time of, of COVID? And how do you attract incoming freshman students who may say, well, I don't, you know, I could pay far less and just take classes online somewhere else. So we've also been under that stress of how do we um, teach synchronously, give our students that individualized education um, be able to still develop those personal relationships with our students so that if we see they're having trouble with something, we can alert people, we can alert our counseling center, we can alert our dean's office, we can say, you know, try to catch them before it's too late. And that's going to be our challenge this semester. Last semester, we all got to meet our students and we had our students in class for about six or seven weeks before we had to go remote. This semester we don't. We're, you know, um, some of us are, are starting in person and then we have this hybrid flex model where half of your students may be in class, but you also have to teach while broadcasting because half of your students are going to be remote or you can only fit half of your students in the classroom at one time 
due to social distancing. So even if they're on campus, half of your students at a time may be remote. I'm teaching exclusively remote um, this semester, largely because of um, a pre-existing health condition. And I'm trying to figure out how, how am I going to meet my students? Do I require them to come to online office hours so I can talk to them one-on-one, -on -one, which totally increases my workload. You know, if I have, now mind you, our class, you know, I have 22 students in each class, but that's still 44 students to have individualized meetings with several times a semester. Um, I've also, I've also thought about maybe having outdoor office hours. Um, so, you know, there's a little park across from campus um, that has some benches and maybe we could, I could meet students who are on campus, but those who are remote, I won't have that opportunity to meet them. And um, so I'm, I'm thinking, you know, for my environment, environmental politics class, um, I may take them out for hikes in the nearby park to do a socially distanced hike, which will also give me a chance to sort of meet with them, but not indoors and not on campus. So it's a challenge of how do you provide excellence in education? How do you provide Imper, you know, personalized education and deal with the vast socioeconomic differences that our students have, which is very reflective of New York City as a whole. And we, for those with kids in New York City public schools, which we're talking about 1.1 million children, still don't know what's going to happen when school starts similar to what Anuka said, um, when school is supposed to start on September 10th. So, and many of our faculty um, not to mention our students have children in New York City public schools and how are they going to juggle their own classes with the needs of their students. So I'll stop there and go on to the next. Thank you so much for uh, sharing uh, that with us. And you're right, COVID-19 has impacted the marginalized and vulnerable communities the most. The physical, mental and emotional toll on the students that affects their focus on education. And it is a challenge to deal with the vast, as you said, socioeconomic differences uh, over there. So thank you for talking to us about the special accommodations uh, of your college for the students who face difficult circumstances at home and how you've addressed the digital divide and also how you have uh, tried to make the education personalized and give the students their individualized education. So thank you once again for sharing that with us today. Our next panelist is Ms. Jeanette LaRue, who is the Director General, Public Education and Community Outreach Division of the Ministry of Environment and Climate Change of the Republic of Seychelles. Ms. Jeanette, you have the floor. Jeanette, you're on mute. You hear me? Yes, I can hear you now. Okay. Hello, everyone. I'm Janet from the Seychelles Islands, a small group of islands in the in Yanushan and the tropical islands, just a bit like the Caribbean. And we have about uh, not we not even 100,000 people yet. So, but we we still have been hit by it, and uh, we have only 136 cases. We had. Presently, there's only nine cases right now, uh, still active. But from the 136, it's mainly fishermen from overseas come because we have fishing and tourism is our main economic um, activity. So they were coming in for to to to, to go on on the fishing boat. It's only uh, it's only 13 Seychellois, well, our people who had the COVID. So, and it was mainly those returning home who were overseas. But when one, one person was working at the airport, got, was tested positive, then we had to go on lockdown for, for three weeks. But the school was, for, for people who are working, but the school was closed for a longer time, for about two months. So during, it, it had a very bad inf impact on our, on our program for environment, education for sustainable development because um, most of activities we have to go to school, we have to do it there. 
it's it's on the field and we that the students were locked down were at home then we had uh, for for us for the teachers who were involved we we had to communicate through whatsapp through through facebook through um, other e online devices but uh, we also had some programs for example the ministry of education has space for, for the schools on national tv they have specific subject for specific level on every day so it was going on so that the students who do not have internet at home those who could not have devices for internet they can follow the classes because the teachers were came on national tv to teach those lessons because we follow the same curriculum so what the maths would be doing at one level in one school they all we'd all be doing the same thing so but the the most mostly everyone were doing more people were doing through online with their teachers they were communicating directly with their teachers so we had to find means and ways but but covid brought along quite some positive things for esd yeah? especially to our environment the changes it was brought about as you know seychelles is tourism is our number one so we use in fact we still have two competitions going on right now for school where they have to do videos they have to do a lot of videos for, for the schools on the changes they are seeing what were the benefits of covid on the environment so they had to follow what's going on in the news they have to go and watch outside you know for example especially the beaches the impact was more there we used to have some the beach was usually very lively and now the beach is empty it's still almost empty we have a few tourists now coming in so we are now starting back to school but we have to be very careful and we can't take more than 30 students outside but now most of our activities has to be on the field where they have for example we do are doing a lot of tree planting we are doing a, a lot of coastal rehabilitation again it's to do with tree planting thing we have a lot of video competitions going on in schools on environment but unfortunately we have to postpone we have usually at the end of the year around november we are we assess the schools on the performance all schools in the country on their performance on of equable it's the edsc program how they've been implementing it but we have to postpone the hour this year we have we they will be assessed on what they've done what they they could do right now for this year and the next year because all the programs for the ESD has to change so it's there like i said there's a, there's a lot of positive things if if one will go on the facebook of the ministry of environment you will see all the videos that the kids are doing on environment the benefit it has especially for clean air they, especially the ocean they will tell you about what they used to see what they seeing now which they haven't seen for a long time in the ocean close to the shore so these are the things you will learn from the kids so it's most of our things now are online but now that we are back to school they are back to school they've just been for example we've just been in holiday now i have to send my program we do, we, we do holiday camps for the children i have to send my program to to the ministry of health to approve and they will advise us what to change to ensure that there's social distancing to ensure that um, we we do not go in risk perhaps what we can call risky areas but the program has been doing well we we've, we're using the ocean a lot because it's not easy to get covid in the ocean and we have it's getting more children and the families going to the beach compared to what they used to in the past so also exploring the forest so it's more in nature where we can keep the distance rather than in a room doing recycling doing things like that which we used to do that's a bit of what we're doing now
Thank you so much, Jeanette, for sharing that with us. And thank you for sharing with us the measures taken by the Ministry of Education mm -hmm. of uh, Seychelles to bridge the digital divide. And with teachers coming on national TV to continue the lessons, I think that is genius. And you also mentioned the creative learning, the video making about the impacts of, mm -hmm. on the environment. And I can uh, personally say that at Green Hope Foundation, our younger members have been making animated education toolkits. And it's been so amazing to see how that has developed their progress in education for sustainable development. And you also mentioned a very, other very important thing, which is the importance of outdoor nature-based activities and how that has continued with coastal rehabilitation, forest learning. So thank you once but, again for sharing. Perhaps education is not only at school now, eh? because there, because we depend a lot of tourism, there's a, there's a lot of people out of job right now. Yeah. And there's one island where, which has been badly in the past, been affected by forest fires, where we are now, now they've got over 100 people who are out of their jobs and learning about the forest, and they are the one going and they are getting allowance from the government, they are getting paid, but instead of staying at home, they are reforesting the forest. And doing that, they are also learning from the NGOs about the importance of protecting the environment, how to do it, what kind of trees they need to put in different areas of the forest, and what are the benefit it will bring to the rivers nearby. So education to the public is also going on, not only in school. So there's quality education going on for adults too. That is truly amazing. And yes, uh, education never stops. So thank you for sharing that with us and how you've continued the quality education and ensure that everyone has access to it in one way or the other. Thank you once again. Mm -hmm. I would now like to invite our next panelist, Dr. Naomi Adif, Assistant Professor, Teaching Stream, Political Science at the University of Toronto, Mississauga. Dr. Adif, you have the floor. Great. Hi, good morning from Toronto. Um, thank you for inviting me to be part of this. Thank you, everybody, for your insights. It's really a pleasure uh, to listen to what people have been up to and some of the creative solutions that folks have uh, adapted in the face of really a like a time that is both challenging um not predicted before and as we know like we don't know when this will end and i think that that um provides another layer of stress um i just want to say before i uh get into it about education that i have a three-year-old she may come home at any minute and she may walk in here uh so that's i'm kind of looking at education both as a university educator and also as a parent of a very small child um and trying to figure out kind of what things are going to look like balancing um, my own labor and the needs of my family this coming year um i uh, am american but have lived in Canada for the last two years. Um, and I uh, have mostly taught in working class universities um, at the City University of New York, at Hunter College and at Queens College, um, and then at Portland State University in Portland, Oregon. And um, I find myself here in Toronto. Um, what's interesting about Canada as compared to the United States is that of course uh, all but like a very very few higher education institutions are public and compared to the american model uh americans look at canadian education and say um that's really inexpensive or that's cheap or it, you know everybody can afford it but that i think something i'd like to address is that that's still not true um so i'm i'm gonna ask some questions from the vantage of what seems like a pretty well-resourced institution in certainly one of the wealthiest nations um, in the world, both um, in terms of its material wealth and uh, its investment in things like education, um, even though I'm sure there are plenty of educators who say like that's, that's not in fact true. Um, so uh, I can tell you a little bit about what happened in the spring, but it's, it's fairly uninteresting um, because COVID hit and everything was shut down with about three weeks left in the semester. And that was just the good fortune of how things are timed around here. Um, and so I said to my teaching assistants um, and to my students, like, we're just getting the shift to Harbor. We're just finishing out the term and doing the best we can and being as flexible as we can with student needs. Um, like some people said, uh, students who wanted to improve their mark or who were counting on that 
had some opportunities and the great majority just got to stop where they were. Um, and again, that was good fortune of timing. Um, some people continued to teach throughout the summer. Uh, I did not, um, but I'm going to begin teaching two courses online in the fall. Um, I teach urban politics and policy and I teach about public space. So um, I'm in a place, I think that um, where there's very fruitful ground to think about this present moment in terms of the political actors, in terms of flows of resources, in terms of, um, as I mentioned, the tremendous wealth. But I wanna back up and um, tell a story about a number of years ago, I was co-teaching with somebody and at the top of my syllabus, there have been two things that I've put over the years. Um, one is a quotation from the Brazilian educator, Paulo Freire in Pedagogy of the Oppressed that says, knowledge emerges only through invention and reinvention through the restless, impatient, continuing, hopeful inquiry, men pursuing the world, with the world, and with each other. Um, and I think that having a principle like this to guide our courses in the university uh, is going to be paramount. Um, in the academy broadly, um, and as Pam said, she you know, works in a teaching focused university, but I would say in the academy broadly, uh, structurally, teaching and learning are not the number one supported thing. Research is what the academy mostly supports. Um, I'm privileged to be in an institution now, the University of Toronto, Mississauga, where they're taking teaching really seriously and they're building up their capacity in what meaningful pedagogy could mean going forward. But if we take the academy at large, um, teaching and learning aren't at the heart of its mission, which seems confusing. Um, and very surprising to a lot of undergraduates when I tell them that, when I tell them, oh yeah, most of your professors have not been trained in pedagogy. Um, most of your professors, you know, they're trained in their discipline and they're doing their best. Um, sorry. Um, so I think actually COVID is a great opportunity to stop and think about the principles of education and what the academy, what university education is actually for and what structures it's perpetuating. Right now, we're deep in a culture, I think, of credentialism where people come to the university, um, they exchange labor for grades or marks and they're walking out with credential. And I think we're not thinking seriously enough about what university students, um, both um, young people and mature students could really be um, developing in this institution. Um, and I think that actually, um, I believe it was Jaya said, um, parents are in the room and they take over. But I also think that um, for a lot of us, we have this realization that um, other people are watching and that um, the classroom needs to be. Uh, Dr. Radif, we can't hear you. You're audio and video have frozen acting and i've heard these stories of that happening um but i also think like we have the opportunity to say okay we're bringing this um this into people's homes we're we're with students in in their experiences and thinking about what that means so i'd like to go back to that furry quote i was co-teaching with somebody been in the academy a lot longer than me somebody very senior to me and he said like why do you have to put that in why are these sort of things important um and I think fundamentally, um, this is a time where we need to challenge our assumptions. Um, we need to challenge, as people have said, our assumptions about uh, the access that people have um, in terms of technology, uh, in terms of time. I think actually this is worse in wealthy institutions where we assume that our students have a lot of what they need when in fact many don't, or they're sharing, or they're doing childcare themselves. Um, things like that. I think uh, this is a moment when we have the opportunity to think about whole person education. Um, as people have said, we are demanding maximum flexibility from both teachers and students in the midst of a time of tremendous stress. Um, and to pretend like our emotional and personal lives are outside of learning, just it, it's, it was never true and now it's untenable. Um, so I actually at times hope that um, my kid will run into my classroom just to remind everybody like we have lives, we have lives. Um, I also think um, that although, and this is, this is the big one, 
um, although Canadian universities are less expensive uh, for the student than many American universities, um, and I realize that's only a small part of the educational institutions in the world, um, it's still hardship for a lot of our students. And I think that um, in some of the wealthiest nations on earth, in the United States, in Canada, um, this is the moment to call to make university free. Um, I think it would change the structure um, of who has access. Uh, I think it would change people's lives afterwards if they're not burdened with debt. Um, and so although I know we're here to talk about um, the day-to-day -day kind of uh, pedagogical questions and how we deal during COVID, um, the structural context politically and economically is fundamental to this. Um, and we, we have the money to make university free. There is plenty of money and we have to um, make political moves um, to put pressure on government to tax wealth and to invest in human systems. I'm gonna stop there. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Reddy, for sharing that with us. And you're right, COVID is an opportunity for us to really uh, stop and think about well, as you said, whole person, meaningful education, about quality education, and also understanding that personal lives of students, of teachers, really intertwine with their education. It's not something that is totally separate. And I think that, you know, we will be able to actually ensure quality education once everyone realizes that. So thank you once again for sharing that with us. Our next speaker is Mr. Stephen King, Lecturer at the School of Media at the Middlesex University, Dubai. Mr. Stephen, you have the floor. Now that's working, correct? Yes. Great stuff. Okay, so thank you again, Kekisham, for inviting me. It's a pleasure to return the favor after so many times you've been able to come and talk at our, our events. So I'm, I'm grateful to, to be invited to one of yours. So that's, um, that's, that's a wonderful experience. Um, Currently, right now, I'm feeling quite positive. Uh, and there's a number, a number of reasons for that. I'm obviously here in Dubai, and obviously we heard uh, the, some of the steps that have been taken here. Uh, but I'm from the School of Media, which means I teach uh, digital media, uh, as well as journalism, advertising, PR. And a lot of the skills and talents that we have within our curricula are really optimized for the situation in which we see right now. Um, the digital media program which we are on has inspired uh, a number of different research uh, uh, programs, uh, one of which has recently been completed onto the backgrounds of people who are participating in these kinds of calls and the impact that uh, whether you have a virtual background, an office background or a picture, or the inability to present yourself has on, on the conversation. And that has a, a very significant impact in terms of teaching, as you will all have experienced the little gray dot that will be in every single student's uh, quadrant. The, the inability to present your face is worse than the inability to make your voice heard. If you cannot be seen, you do not exist. And in this kind of an environment where we are in this digital environment, uh, where the only exposure we get to others is through these little boxes, it will become increasingly difficult to empathize with others the longer that we continue uh, with an only digital environment. And one of the points of Kekishan, one fourth question was, how do we get peace and sustainable development incorporated within the distance learning. And this is something which I think is, is something which we, we really need to, to think about is that when we remove the interpersonal relationships, we're preventing young people at very important points of their lives from developing those empathy for others that will help to cultivate an appreciation for peace. Instead of having face-to-face -face deep and meaningful relationships and arguments and discussions and debates, we are being limited to computer game characters, which can be, you know, pixelated out uh, at any particular time. Um, and we have, uh, in the course of the research that we've done, we've discovered the issues with having multiple children in the same household. We've seen uh, situations where children who are extremely confident in the classroom 
are unable to show themselves because they're either embarrassed or unable to present what's in, in their backdrop. And uh, this, has, this, is, this, is a, this is something which we're, we're looking into and we're looking at different ways of enhancing that experience. Um, one thing which looking on education talking into the world of computer games themselves, just these virtual worlds, uh, to see how we can incorporate those environments into the teaching form because uh, some uh, programs would be completely non-teaching purposes, which have a lot of functionality that can be transferred over. They're not quite yet, but, but we, we need to be looking for ways which will give the student the same comfort, uh, the same ability to interact as if they can in the classroom. As, so um, my university is part of a four campus system. So we're from the UK, we have also in Mauritius. Uh, next door to Seychelles, uh, and we also have up in Malta as well. So um, we're, uh, we have an advantage of having a, a cross-campus team working on it. We also have a good education faculty and a very good uh, IT faculty. And when it came to the COVID shutdown early in March, we were fortunate enough that those two faculties were able to come up uh, and work together to identify ways to, to, take, us, uh, to take us to the end of term. And they have also been working all over the summer to come up with a program of blended learning and face-to-face -face learning and distance learning, which will start uh, with government approvals uh, towards the end of September. Um, in terms of uh, the new normal, um, I liked what Dr. Adiv was saying about the purpose of education. And I'm looking now at what's happening in the UK and how the grades problems that they're having. And I'm wondering whether there is a discussion now to be had towards having more pass-fail style of, uh, of, of grading systems towards the exits of education versus this continuous chasing of grades, especially uh, with, with the current situation where it will be changing over the course of this term in terms of the experiences the students will be having. And ultimately, I'm really looking forward to seeing how we can, at the moment, we, the, we're using these internet platforms where it's Zoom or Microsoft Teams as a direct replacement or as trying to copy what we do in the classroom. Um, this kind of transition has happened in many other industries. It's happened in, for example, in print and newspapers and, uh, and e-commerce. And so you have a version 1.0 of websites which was just an interactive website. It just looked like a shop front. It didn't take any advantage of the technology or what the technology could provide. And so I think as we move into the next few months, we're going to be seeing maybe a tech, a, an education version 1.0 or 1.1, depending on how we've developed. And we will be needing to accelerate to education, online education versus two versus three, which will include a lot more interactivity and engagement and deployment of software applications to enhance the teaching and to try and make this internet environment not just a temporary replacement, but something which is a superior offering uh, and a preferred offering, uh, bearing in mind all of the technical and geographical environmental problems that, that people will face. And I, and I don't really want to take too much time because I could probably talk and talk and waffle and waffle and waffle around. I, ho I hope that I've raised a couple of points there. Uh, also, uh, and, um, and I hope that uh, we, we can continue some of those discussions with our learning panelists as we move forward. Thank you so much, Stephen, for uh, sharing your perspectives with us. And you're right, it, it will be, and it is increasingly difficult to uh, now develop the, the qualities of empathy for one another with the removal of interpersonal relationships, relationships and difficult to develop their progress in uh, peace education. But you're also right that it's important for us now to ensure that with quality education and increased digital learning, how can we accelerate towards 
interactive digital education to enhance the teaching and make that not just a temporary replacement, but something that becomes a preferred and superior option for education, but of course taking into account all of the other intersectional challenges that hinder that progress. So thank you once again for sharing that with us. I would now like to invite our next panelist, Mr. Kevin Glennon, who is the Education Coordinator and EcoSchools Bahamas National Operator of Brief in the Bahamas. Kevin, you have the floor. Thank you for the opportunity to be on your panel today. Um, first of all, I think we here in the Bahamas share many of the similar experiences and challenges that all the panelists have um, already um, spoken about. Um, we here in the Bahamas, though, have a have had a particular special challenge, and if I'm and I, I'm asking you to permit me to just put out our um, adaptation to providing education during the pandemic into perspective and against the backdrop of a recently challenging experience by our country, and that is the passage of Hurricane Dorian last September. This um, Tuesday will make a year since that, that storm hit us, Category 5 storm, strongest storm hitting the, um, the islands, and even in the, in the Atlantic in history. And so um, prior to the current pandemic, uh, the Bahamas um, was challenged in providing education for thousands of students that were displaced because of this um, hurricane. And um, in fact, some schools that were severely impacted by the, by the storm are still under repair and being outfitted for the start of new school, for the new school year. And, and that again will be limited students. And we also looking at blended and face-to-face. Um, -face. Fortunately for us, we are an archipelago of 700 islands, um, islands in Keys, 30 are inhabited. And like I said, fortunately for us, um, there are several islands that were not that are actually COVID free. So they may actually open with, um, with regular classes. Again, still practicing the social distancing because again, you know, how COVID goes, we don't know exactly who may have it and who doesn't have it. So, and um, again, I'll just remain closed for the entire school, this new, the entire school year, 2020-21, due to severe damage requiring major construction. And that, that again, is in, in lieu of the hurricane that passed last September. We are still in a um, recovery mode. So prior to that, for several years, the Ministry of Education in particular um, had a distance learning platform in place, partly in response to uh, specialty teacher shortages on several islands of the Bahamas. So we had some sort of um, distance learning in place. However, in the aftermath of Hurricane Dorian, the virtual school program, as it is called, was scaled up and three learning cable TV channels were established. And this is, this is before March the 15th when we got our first case. All of this was going on after September 1st last year. Um, so the virtual schools program was scaled up and um, three cable, cable TV channels were established to meet, to meet um, the needs of um, those children that, like in similar, some, similar countries as we heard this one, did not have access to devices or um, Wi-Fi. And so, and then especially in those two islands that were severely impacted by, by the hurricane and the Abacos in Grand Bahama. Those two islands also represent our second and third economic drivers. And similar to Jeanette in the seashells, we depend on tourism and there are a number of thousands of people out of work right now. So that, that has even exacerbated our challenges. During that same time, and I'm talking about post the hurricane, private schools also implemented online instructions. And, and since COVID, they've also scaled up that level of, of, of education. Um, the Stephen was talking about the national examinations in Britain. We started ours back in, I think, April and had to postpone it when we had a second wave of, um, of COVID and that's still pending. Um, I don't know what the ministry is going to decide on that. Whether or not a pass-fill um, system would work, Stephen, I don't know. That may be a little harsh on more, more people. Um, so, but since, since the confirmation of our first case on March 15th, all of these efforts 
have been scaled up even more. Now, um, whether or not it, it, it was perfect, I, I can't say yes. Uh, whether or not everybody was able to, to, to um, take advantage of it, I, I can't say yes to that either. So going to your, to your second um, question, um, Ms. Bazu, what extra efforts did we take uh, to ensure the students didn't miss out on their learning. Well, at Brief, where I work, and I work at a nonprofit, non government organization, um, we promote the conservation of the human marine environment. That's a stay in our way of life. So we're a marine conservation organization. So what we did in our capacity, you know, we have, we have, we interact with schools in a couple of our programs, which I'll talk about in a minute. But we actually promoted the availability of our virtual marine conservation presentations and resources via our website. Nationally, the Ministry of Education led an intensive public relations campaign to encourage students to take advantage of digital learning platforms and for parents to ensure that students remain focused. Um, Non-government organizations and local and international philanthropies and private citizens purchased laptops, solar power, solar power, um, solar power tablets for students without the means. And um, we have two telecommunications companies provided as best as they can free Wi-Fi or affordable plans for students and teachers. Was it sufficient? No. Was it perfect? No. They all take advantage of it. In other words, I'm talking about students. I don't think so. And can we improve? Definitely. Uh, what does the new normal um, mean for educators? Well, as an, educa as an educator, um, educators must now reorient and adapt their usual teaching methodology or pedagogy to reflect the ever-changing dictates of the COVID-19 reality. And that is social distancing, the face-to-face -face limitations, the virtual classroom, outdoor learning, which brief is all about. And we have had to adjust to that because our we take most of our work is taking students out there into the ocean and into the environment, uh, the marine environment. And so um, to try and, and also all the while trying to fill those educational gaps that, that have been created by the, the pandemic. Um, as educators, we must now more than ever, and I need to hammer this, actively engage parents because that sometimes for me as, as, a, as an educator is, is the weakest link in the chain of education. We must actively engage parents to ensure, to ensure their support in educating their children and providing opportunities for both the academic and skills development of their children. Um, independent learning will be key moving forward. Um, and other forms of learning, but independent learning more than, more than, more than ever, I think will be key in moving forward. Um, the role of education for sustainable development moving forward at, at brief. This continues to be supported by our education for sustainable development um, through, through um, our foundation for environmental education programs. We have two programs that we run um, under the auspices of the foundation for environmental education. We have eco schools that targets um, children um, K through 12. And then we have the young reporters for the environment program. I don't know if you ever heard about that, Stephen, but that deals with um, journalism. Um, and that, that I think is from 11 to 25. So in, in closing, um, with the increasing evidence that there's a direct correlation between our interaction with the environment and the emergence of zoonotic diseases like COVID-19, it is imperative, I think, that we continue on in our efforts to promote um, education for sustainable development, um, which is also, you know, and pandemic, before I close, has also brought to light the vulnerability of many things, including food productions and, and supply chains. So these and other factors like climate change in particular, make it imperative that, we, that our work in education for sustainable development continues. And I thank you so much. Thank you so much, Kevin, for sharing that with us and I was in the Bahamas a couple months just before the hurricane struck and I want to tell our audience that the young people there are so motivated to protect the planet and we did some projects together with Reef actually and I just wanted to say it's truly amazing that you've continued 
uh, that education both in formal and non-formal ways. And yes, uh, the Bahamas was affected tremendously by the hurricane. So thank you for talking about the measures that you took in terms of ensuring the continuation of quality education after the hurricane and after the pandemic hit as well, and also how you adapted to virtual learning and ensuring the education through uh, television. And you are right, educators must reorient and adapt to all the changes brought about by COVID-19. And it is so important to engage parents as well and ensure their support in students' education. So thank you once again. And thank you to all of our panelists for this truly engaging discussion on how we can take forward quality education and meaningful education in the new normal. So I will now open the floor for questions. Uh, I would like to ask your audience that if you do have questions, please raise your hands and I can already see two raised hands. So our first question is from Anania Orpe. So I will be promoting Anania to a panelist. So there will be a few seconds delay before Anania comes, she is here. Great. If, Anania, if you could unmute yourself, that would be great. Hello, everyone. Thank you, panelists. My name is Ananya. I'm from Dubai. I'm 11 years old. My question is to Ms. Janet and Mr. Kevin. Your countries are so naturally beautiful. Can you talk a bit more about your outdoor classes and lessons? Janet, Kevin, you have the floor. I will let Jeanette go. <laughs> Jeanette, you're on mute. You're still on mute. I, I, I can go while she's um, our a brief, our outdoor classroom, we call it field studies, where one, we go, we take students to the um, coral reef, they actually snorkel a coral reef. Um, we also have a, a, a um, rocky shore walk where, and all of these are, all of these are filled with um, different activities. It's not just going there, but you know, they're, they're follow-up activities. So we have a rocky shore field study, we have a coral reef snorkel, we have a mangrove creek um, walk and snorkel, and um, I'm missing one, and then we have a sandy shore. Um, walk and uh, but there are two there are two events where we actually take students in the water and the ability to swim is not a criteria um, we will work we work with whatever level of swim ability that you have and we have you know we, we take the safety precautions unfortunately right now that's on hold until we get our COVID um, situation like many other countries under under control where we can ask because you, you can't take students in the water without touching them, <laughs> you know, and, and they're gonna. So, but that's basically um, the, the programs that we run at Brief in terms of outdoor learning. Thank you so much, Kevin. Jeanette, you have the floor. Yes, yeah, so I'm Trudy. I'm on the national TV right now talking about my program that they did for the school holidays. In Seychelles, we do a lot of marine, like the Bahamas. I've been to the Bahamas before, so I know a little bit what he's talking about. We do a lot of marine because we are surrounded by, by the ocean and the kids love it. They, they, they love the beach here, they love the ocean. You know, in the past, some parents were a bit, uh, a bit reluctant to send children to the beach because in, in case they, they drown and so on. But now that we have swimming classes, you know, Children, but children are more more likely to go on in the sea now. But with the COVID, something positive with the COVID in in regards to marine education, the, 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 there's, there was no tourists, so the dive centers were promoting very good packages for the local people and the children. And during the school holidays, we make the good use of that, and many students had had the chance to go diving intro dives so and now they're working with parents for to do a special package again so that they can advance their diving co courses 
Seychelles also is very green, very mountainous, very challenging. There's, the biodiversity is very high in, in, uh, in the forest. So what happened in the COVID, it's not only for the children, but what happened in the COVID we noticed families because we, we had to avoid traveling uh, with different people from different homes. So families were going on nature trails together. Every day we had people going on nature trails together. So it, it, it was an advantage for us so that we, we can walk, go out as families. But like I've said, I don't know if it's happening in the Bahamas. Now that there's no tourists, there are quite a lot of packages, not only for diving, but also for for snorkeling, those boats which used to take tourists for snorkeling, they are now organizing special packages for the for the local people, for the children and adults. Thank you so much. Can I just? Yes, Stephen. I, I feel I, I always feel that the UAE ha also has some very beautiful outdoor learning experiences as well, and I've been fortunate enough to take some of our first years uh, into the mountains of Jebel Jais uh, and into the wadis of Fujairah. Uh, so, do, uh, as well as the beautiful places, because I've been to the Seychelles and it's beautiful, I know that's, that's gorgeous, but you have beautiful places at home as well, and, I, and uh, there's, there's universities and high schools will, will take you to those as well, okay? Mm, I feel I just have to say that because of it. <laughs> Thank you so much, and yes, at Green Hope, we've definitely been to a lot of the amazing places in the UAE, but we've also been to those amazing places in Seychelles and in the Bahamas. So thank you for sharing mm -hmm. that with us. And Ananya, your point is really important because many, many, many years ago, Nobel laureate Rabindranath Tagore actually started the university in Shantiniketan with the whole uh, prospect of outdoor education. And at that time, it was looked upon as very strange. But now, mm -hmm. in today's world, outdoor education and nature-based learning is so important. So thank you very much, Ananya, for your very crucial, important question. Mm -hmm. I will now take our next question from, let's see, Aliyu. So Aliyu, I am promoting you to a panelist. Let's see. Aliyu, if you can unmute yourself, that will be great. Uh, thank you. Thank you so very much. Uh, I'm Aliyu J. Pusa from Liberia, West Africa. Uh, I have a question for uh, all of the panelists. So my questions have to do with um, going back to normality. With all of the difficult situations that we are faced with in the world now, if everything should have been like over one day up, are we, is it still incorrigible like to have a two ways of learning, like going to impression learning and also prioritizing of, of online learning. Is it still knowledgeable to do so? Thank you, Aliyah, for a question. Would any of our panelists like to take that? I don't mind, this goes into, we could have a long debate on the purpose of education. Right, this is what it comes down to. Uh, I think what you'll find is that it, online education is good for some things, um, and face-to-face -face learning is good for probably, I would argue, a few, a lot more, maybe. Um, the, the, there is so, only so much you can learn from YouTube or from a book. You really do get a significant amount of, of wider skills, of softer skills, um, f from being in the classroom environment. So although I think, I mentioned earlier, we need to make the internet experience competitive and superior, that has got to be a, a vision. I think, uh, personally, I, I feel that the face-to-face -face contact has, has still, I can't imagine a situation where face-to-face -face will be less than online um, for, for a holistic experience. Um, but there will always be elements of of both in there. That's, that's, my, that's my first opening. I will pass to Dr. Adif. Maybe. Or. Sure. Um, I think um, that uh, online learning and 
in-person learning have different advantages, but I would also say um, that this is a moment, like if we're gonna speak about opportunity, for students to decide what they want to learn. Um, teachers and professors can um, guide you, but I also think um, this is a really powerful moment um, to say, uh, like, I want to read these things, to get your hands on books and come up with ways to discuss them with other people. Like, there's no magic that teachers have. What we do is we create structures of accountability. So we say, you're going to read this by this day, you're going to turn in this paper by this day, and we're here to answer questions. But I think um, that even for university educators, um, the idea that we're big experts is sometimes overblown. Um, and actually um, your ability, th this could be a very empowering moment, I think, um, to consider what it is you wanna learn um, and uh, to put demands on the institutions of education to get you there. Thank you. Can I add something? Yes. Quickly, I, oh, sure. I um, building on what Naomi said, that it depends on what you wanna learn and also um, there's some areas, particularly in the sciences and engineering, where you really need access to labs, you need access to practical education that you may not be able, you may not, you're not going to have that equipment at home. It's very, very rare. And having that in-person learning to get that practical, those practical skills are really important. And I think the other thing, and this goes down also to elementary um, and secondary education as well, is that socialization being able to get along with other people, being able to deal with conflict, being able to um, have those interactions with not only your classmates, but with um, your teachers or authority figures um, is also important because that'll help you navigate life. And I'm hopeful that our life will not continue to be in these little boxes. Absolutely, Anuka, you yeah. Uh, I was going to say, as an elementary teacher, um, I would say that, yes, it is important to do the online, but as everyone has suggested, face-to-face -face is also important. I think this is a great time to take education and rethink about what it is kids need to learn for the future. I think our education system right now is very based on what getting them ready for a job for the future, but jobs are consistently changing. So I think this is a good time where educators are forced to learn the online platform, where who are very scared, like a lot of us are very scared of how we use it, what is it, to take what we're learning and enhance the program in our face-to-face -face situation. So you're no longer just reading a book, but trying to teach kids how to do both so that they also can go from a face-to-face -face social situation to be able to have a face-to-face -face conversation online, which a lot of the students that I did during online learning had a difficulty understanding how to have that conversation and connect with the people they've connected with for three, four, five years online. So I think a little bit of both, but to use digital to enhance what we're already doing face-to-face. -face. Thank you so much, Anuka. Would any of our other panelists like to answer that? Or but in, in, let me, in environment, yes, it's difficult to do it only online. We, we, there, there, there has to be some sort of interaction. We have to be outside, we have to be on the field. It, online is really not minimal we can do for ESD. Absolutely. Uh, if none of our other panelists have comments, then I shall move to take uh, the last question from our audience. Thank you so much, uh, Aliyu, for your very important uh, question. And our last question is from, let's see, Lauren Fernandez. So Lauren, you have the floor. Lauren will be joining us as a panelist in a few seconds. Hello, Lauren. Uh, yeah, hello everyone. Thank you panelists for the amazing discussion. I'm Lauren Fernandez from Uman. My question is to all the panelists. When you talk about peace in your classrooms and lecture halls, do you connect it to nuclear disarmament? Thank you, Lauren. Uh, 
would any of our panelists like to take that? I see Pam nodding her head. It's part of what I teach. So um, interesting, you know, I don't just teach peace, but I teach a number of courses dealing with international politics, international um, organizations and such. And I think I talk about nuclear disarmament in almost every class I teach um, because it's, it's important and it's, you need to, you know, you can't forget that. And in fact, one of the questions I'm asking my students in my US foreign policy class to discuss later this semester is, you know, what are the nuclear threats today? Which would they consider to be the biggest nuclear threat? Um, is it aging nuclear equipment? Is it North Korea? Is it Iran? Is it the United States? Is it Russia? Um, is it China? There's lots of, you know, or India, Pakistan, many, many places where this is still an issue. And I think it's important to talk about, and sometimes these issues, particularly with regard to peace, get lost with the day to day. Um, but we have to remember that it's still there. And there's, um, and I'm actually reading a novel right now written by a friend of mine um, about somebody who worked in on the first nuclear bomb that was um, that hit you know the, the ones that hit Nagasaki and Hiroshima in Japan and who is working on it not knowing what he's working on because it's top secret but he's doing the mathematical calculations for it I haven't gotten that far in the books so I don't know what's going to happen but those you know even putting it in novelized ways to enable people to realize that it's still an issue and it's still part of our discussion on peace and part of our discussion, I think, on sustainable development. Awesome. So Thank I think it's a great question. Thank you so much. Yeah, uh, would any of our other panelists like to answer that? Yes, Stephen, you have unmuted yourself. I, I, we've not covered it, but we do allow the students to pick any particular issue of their interests. Uh, it hasn't necessarily come up in, 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 that, in that regards. Uh, what has come up in terms of peace has been other forms of smaller violence. So it's even violence against women, uh, bullying. Um, the, it, it doesn't have to be international or global destruction um peace is is not also not just quiet it's it has to be a, a proper uh, understanding and empathy and love if you like for the people around you it's not just tolerance it's it's a, it's a case of having um a, a proper understanding and appreciation of, of of the people around you and that's one of the biggest worries that i have from this online environment because we will lose that environment of of of, of, of empathy and it will make it more easy for people to, to go into conflict. Awesome. Thank you so much. Yes, Dr. Eddie. Yeah, um, Lauren, I would just like to encourage you to continue to put pressure on your teachers and educational institutions to address these really big issues. Um, I don't think they're too big for young people. I think it's fundamental. Um, and I'm pleased that you asked the question. It's not the scale at which I work, because I work at the urban. Um, but um, questions, the big ones, right, the existential ones like climate change, um, like the nuclear threat, um, we bring them up and we continue to address them when our students put pressure on us and on our educational institutions. And so I hope you will. Thank you so much uh, to your panelists. And uh, yes, Lauren, that is a, such an important question that at be a Green Hope actually promote disarmament education because nuclear disarmament is, uh, so important for everyone and young people play a very imp important role in that so it should not be ignored in uh, the education system so thank you Lauren for bringing that up and for your very important uh, question and uh, with that I would like to thank all of our panelists and I would like to give our panelists uh, 60 seconds to give what just a few wrap-up comments. So we shall start in reverse order. So I'd like to give Kevin the floor. You have 60 seconds. Yes, I would just like to remind everyone, the audience and panelists at the end of the day, um, I know what we are doing moving forward is, you know, content is important, but the development of key competencies. And I think, um, Kekishan, you know about the UNESCO key competencies that we want to develop in, in terms of education for sustainable development that but those are key 
and that um, we just have to keep um, moving with the target, as it were. And I, I, the educational system and educators are, are resilient. Children are resilient, and um, I'm an optimist, and we're going to get through this. Thank you so much, Kevin. Uh, Stephen, you have the floor. Yeah, I also want to be very jolly and make people have a smile. Uh, don't be, take all the precautions, but don't terrify yourself. Don't be too scared. I think the, the greatest problem of the COVID is the excess fear. Um, on top of that, I would say, please remember that these are not boxes. The people do live behind the boxes and just the same way as you should not judge a book by its cover and that taking your first impression is very dangerous during this period if you are meeting people the first time you must take double triple quadruple the effort to get to know the people behind the screen and to breathe 500 times before you write a message especially if that message is potentially nasty thank you so much uh stephen for that uh dr Eddie, you have the floor Sure. Um, I would like to reiterate um, that education is really about whole people, um, about advancing a society with basic welfare for all, um, and to be gentle with ourselves um, and kind to ourselves in a time of uncertainty, um, and also uh, to understand our educational institutions in the larger social and political context in which they exist and to use this moment as an opportunity uh, to put pressure on the state and on civil society um, to share all the goods that we hold in common. Thank you so much. Uh, Jeanette? COVID-19 COVID has taught us a lot of lessons. Eh? Uh, no matter where you live, you reach and pool, uh, north and south, tropical, but uh, in all this, I've been thinking very a lot during during the during the break uh, the lockdown, for example. And what I'm seeing on TV as a small island state, what I'm seeing, I think we have to revisit what we call development, developed countries, development. COVID has taught us a lot in this regard. Who is really developed and who is underdeveloped? Because in the end, we are we were all in the same boat and countries which were, were depending on expecting to to be ahead of of the others to help the others are, are worse hit than than the others and stay safe everyone uh, Seychelles have managed to to keep it our numbers down with a lot and a lot of awareness and education especially on national media a lot of restriction when it comes to environment, it has taught us the environment education is not only in school. Yes, it is not only in school. It's as a family, go out and enjoy the environment. Thank you so much, Jeanette. Pam, you have the floor. Well, I agree with what everyone else has said and to pick up on what Jeanette has said, um, it is important to get outside um, and to, for children to get outside parents to get outside everyone. And um, that's something that I committed to on the very first day. And um, every day I go out for a walk or for a run. And one of the things that I've done is I've been taking photos and posting photos each, positive photos each day from nature and trying to change that online discussion away from negativity and to the fact that here I am in the Bronx, New York, and the amount of wildlife that I see on a daily basis is absolutely amazing. And so I'm trying to encourage people to not only you know, focus on their education, but take time to connect with the world outside your monitor. And I wish I was in the Seychelles right now so that I could do some of your, act. I've been there, I love it. And <laughs> I would love to do some of your outdoor activities. Same with the Bahamas. Thank you so much. Um, uh, Anuka, you have the floor. Uh, a lot of what everybody is saying is exactly what I'm thinking, but this is an unprecedented time where we have the opportunity as educators, as parents, as children to rethink and be innovative and creative and do all these really cool things that we never really thought of and think outside of the box. 
And I think we should take that time that where the whole world slowed down and remember that we don't have to rush through everything and take that time and slow down and reflect and create and innovate in any way that you can and take the good part of COVID. I know there's lots of really difficult things, but that slowing down of the entire world was an amazing thing to observe and watch and for us to always remember to take that time with the people that we love and slow down. Thank you so much, Anuka. Uh, Ms. Jaya? Uh, Ms. Jaya, we can't hear you. Well, I have unmuted yeah. myself. Yes, yeah. now we can hear you. So I would like to conclude by saying that I'm with all the panelists because yes, pandemic is definitely a challenge, but it has given us the opportunity to learn so many new things. For me, I feel besides the skills in uh, IT, et cetera, what the pandemic has really taught us is how we are all connected by a common thread of humanity. So I think the world has become a smaller place because we all have become more humane. We have become more charitable. We understand others. And this is what is for me uh, where the biggest opportunity I see. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Jaya. And I would like to thank all of our panelists. The past hour and a half has been, has brought out so many important points on how we can actually take forward quality education in the new normal. And I'd like to thank all of you for such a wonderfully constructive discussion. And these are indeed very challenging times as spoken about by all of our panelists and will really require the, uh, the collaborative efforts from all stakeholders to ensure that we are able to transform our social systems with education being that key ingredient in empowering our current and future generations. And as we heard, the challenges are unique to each region, but as we also all agreed, the process of building back better must have education at its centerpiece and as we continue to ensure that we also have education for sustainable development and disarmament education and we really need to have that ability to adapt to the new normal and it will require the unprecedented support from governments as well as investments in infrastructure to bridge the digital divide and take into account diverse socioeconomic backgrounds but I would just like to thank all of you again for your time and insights as we discuss such an important topic in today's day and age. So let us all continue to work together to build a new world order where no one is left behind and everyone has a life of dignity. So to our panelists and our audience on Zoom and Facebook Live, please stay safe as the pandemic is not yet over. We look forward to seeing you at our next webinar. Thank you, everyone, and have a wonderful weekend. Thank, Thank you so you. much, everyone. Bye. Bye.